people's imaginations in, in this particular context uh, in the last year or two, the way it's, it's sort of blossomed and exploded and the fact that it's become a kind of competition to see how many friends uh, you can have on your Facebook. So it's not uncommon for some people to claim three, five hundred friends, even a thousand actually. Um, I, I suggest that if you do actually claim that, any anyway, Probably you don't know most of these people. They're just voyeurs into your life. And you could probably, with advantage, do without some of them. Uh, and the question is, why is that the case? The simple answer is, it's Dunbar's number. And I thank whoever created that acronym. I have no idea who did it. It just appeared out of the blue on the internet. It's a wonderful thing, the internet. <laughs> and it, it sort of uh, took off. Um, but there we are. And that number is about 150. There's a lot of variation around that, um, to, be, to be fair. Uh, and I, I hesitate to say where that variation lies. Some of it's due to gender differences. <laughs> and I won't tell you which way it goes for fear of offending half the audience. Right. But w why is it limited at 150? Uh, the, the answer is twofold, actually. Partly, it's a cognitive challenge just to keep track of more people. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. The other side of it is, is it's just a, a time budgeting problem. You just don't have time in, the, in everyday life to invest in each of those people uh, to the extent where you can have a real relationship with them. We've come to see, well, actually, we've learned two things out of all this work we've been doing over the last maybe five years on these kind of things. One is we have no idea what relationships are. Probably some of you can tell us. We certainly don't know. And we come to the conclusion that none of the kind of grand spectrum of social psychology and so on, which has spent a lot of time looking at this, actually know either. And we think it's probably because friendships in this sense, relationships in general, are emotional things. So we know when we know what we mean by a relationship when we see it. So if you see two people in a relationship, or when you have a relationship, you know you have one. But we can't kind of verbalize it. We can't put it into words to say what it is. And I think, actually, that's why poets get such um, uh, uh, recognition by us generally, because they, they just have that skill to be able to put into words these kind of, if you like, right brain, emotional feelings which we find very difficult to actually express. So it, you know, we, we can't kind of get it up into our conscious mind and our language left side of the brain and sort of uh, say something about the quality and, uh, of the relationship we have. So we have no way of comparing relationships in the end. That's a real problem from our point of view because we can't really compare quality of relationship against the outcome. Do certain kinds of relationships last longer uh, and so on. We can't even do it between different species. So lots and lots of species have um, uh, monogamous pair-bonded mating systems, but we don't know how they compare or whether they're similar to our pair-bonded romantic relationships and so on. Okay, so that kind of cognitive side of it is sort of offset by the fact that you have to invest in relationships. You have to do stuff with people in order to build a relationship with them. And it seems as though the amount of time you need to invest uh, is kind of proportional to the quality of the relationship, or should I say the quality of the relationship is proportional to the amount of time you spend doing stuff with people. So if you look at the pattern of your relationships, what, in this 150 as it were, what you'll find is it actually consists of a series of layers, a bit like this ripples on a pond, if you drop a pebble in the pond, if you're the pebble, if you can imagine the layers, the ripples going out are the layers of your relationships. And as you go out, you include more people, but you're including relationships at a lower quality. And that ties up very closely with the amount of time you spend with those people. So the amount of time you spend with this inner core of about five, there's another curious feature of it, uh, is the, the layers scale 
in a very, very consistent pattern. So they, they, they occur at 5, 15, 50, 150. Then we know out beyond that there's a 500 and a 1500. And I might tell you as we're in, in, in the hall of, of the arts here, if I can borrow that bit for the moment, Plato got the next number out. He said the ideal democracy size is 5,300. That was 350 years ago. Sorry, 350 BC. Rather. You know, we've learned nothing. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> When the, these, we have no idea why you get such consistent layering. Uh, it seems to be very widely occurring. It's a very robust effect. And it seems to be a consequence, partly, of the amount of time you can afford to spend with certain relationships. So the quality of the relationships, depending on what you do with people. And that's kind of interesting, because it actually highlighted a fact that we've tended to overlook. And most of the sciences have largely overlooked, too. And that's touch, how important touch is to us. Uh, you get, you know, I kind of often say a, a touch is worth a thousand words any day because you get so much more of a sense of what the person intends who's saying something from the way they touch you as they say it than from the actual words. The words are obviously very slippery, but somehow physical contact can convey meaning, emotional meaning, in a way that words simply cannot. And in terms of the internet and, and kind of social network type sites, that's a real problem. Until they invent virtual touch, <laughs> I think you'll never kind of have uh, networked kind of relationships which are in any way really like the ones you have in everyday life. So you've got these two constraints, and they're the things that really limit the size of your social network in the end. And it raises the question of then, well, what happens on, on your social networking sites? You've got all these people out there, um, and you talk to them. We talk to some of them. Actually, most of the traffic is going to the inner core, <laughs> as in everyday life. But it raises the question about whether social network site relationships are as good as everyday relationships. And our answer seems to be no way, because you're not interacting with them face to face. What the network sites do very nicely, as does email, as does phones, is allow you to prevent relationships decaying over time when geographical distances prevent you actually going to the pub together. But if you don't go to the pub together, sooner or later, that relationship will gradually bump down through these circles and eventually drop off the end of the 150. And the 150 is kind of that set of relationships that really you can rely on. They, I, I kind of, there's two ways I like to think of them. One, one is it's the group of people, if you bumped into them at uh, the, the, the um, transit lounge in Hong Kong airport at 3 a.m., uh, you would go up to and you know, immediately without embarrassment because you know where they stand in your life and they know where you stand in, in their life. And you'd have some catching up to do probably, but it would be kind of a, it's a reciprocated relationship and, and uh, it's real, it has a history. And the people out beyond the 150, you can't do that with. You know, you, you know them. You know, you know Andrew Marr because he reads, you know, he does programs on the radio. But does he know you? <laughs> you can have him on your Facebook, maybe, or you can be on his Facebook. But does he really care, <laughs> for example? Um, <clears throat> and the other one is really it's about favors, because that's the circle of people who, in the end, will do you a favor if, if you really want. Now, there is another sort of dimension to this, which was a surprise to us, actually, and that is how important kinship is in that context. We just assume friends are friends, and so does things like Facebook. They, they just use a generic term for it. But in fact, your social world consists of two groups of people, kin and friends, and they behave very, very differently. They're scattered throughout. One thing I might point out is that you prioritize, even here, as it were, you think of kinship, traditional societies, anthropology, all this kind of thing, uh, South American Indians in the Amazon jungle, that's what they do. Uh, it turns out to be incredibly important for us, much more important than we had realized. For one thing, kinship relationships do not decay with time and distance in the way that friendships do. There's something that holds them up there as a sort of special category, so they're immune to these distance effects. Even if you don't see somebody for several years, and they ring you up and say, hello, it's your second cousin twice removed, Fred here and I'm coming into London. Can you put me up? You just go, of course. <laughs> you wouldn't do that for anybody. <laughs> but you, know, you haven't seen this person for years and years and years, and you do that. Um, the other side of it is that people who come from big 
kinship groups who have big extended families have fewer friends in the conventional sense of friends, that's to say. They, in other words, we prioritize kin. And I think it's because, I, I hate to give you younger folk bad advice here, it's because you can abuse your kin and they'll still come to your help. <laughs> if you do that with friends, they will never speak to you again. It's as simple as that. And that's, friendships are very fragile. There's something about kinship that makes it really deep-seated and uh, okay, it's sort of a product of our evolutionary past, as it were. Okay, so <clears throat> let me go back to the, the brains bit. We actually uh, been a lot of stuff really quite interesting stuff going on in the neurosciences in the last really f no more than five years actually. But one of the effects we came up with, which was entirely unexpected, is this. It goes back to the fact that this whole idea of Dunbar's number and there's a limit, a cognitive limit on the number of relationships you can have. It goes back to a relationship I found some years ago now relating social group size in primates to the size of their brains, particularly the size of the neocortex. And in fact, it was predicting human group sizes, given human brain sizes, off the back of that primate relationship that produced this number 150. Um, about three years ago, we decided we ought to do a really concerted effort to look to see whether the same relationship held in other species. People have been having a go at it, and they've been getting very mixed results. And we realized that the reason for this was actually this quantitative relationship between group size and brain size doesn't apply outside the primates, with a very small number of exceptions. The horses, for example, is the one group of mammals where it actually does apply. But for all mammals and birds in general, this relationship between group size and brain size doesn't work. What you get is a really strong effect of pair-bonded monogamy. It's pair bo species with pair-bonded monogamy that have unusually big brains in all the birds and mammals. And that what primates seem to have done is taken that, well, let me, let me just say first that our interpretation of that is that maintaining pair bonds, close romantic relationships, if you like, is very hard work. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> Um, because you, you basically you have to factor in what the other person wants into your calculations of what you ought to be doing today. Because if you wander off, you know, if you think about birds sitting on the nest with the eggs, uh, if you know, sort of one partner or the other wanders off to the pub and spends all weekend there and doesn't come back, it leaves the other partner in a kind of invidious position of either having to abandon the eggs to go and feed or uh, to sit there and prevent the eggs going cold and so on and starving. So this is obviously no good. You've got to have much more integrated, kind of coordinated, um, paired process, and that depends on having, it seems, a big brain to do all the calculations and work all that out. So it seems that uh, monogamy is especially taxing. Um, and it, in fact, when we looked at the primate data again, lo and behold, they're bubbling along underneath the primate relationship between group size and brain size was the same effect species of primates that are pair-bonded, have pair-bonded monogamy, have somewhat bigger brains than you'd expect for species that live in groups of that size. Um, humans seem to be exceptional there, we can't figure out quite what's going on. Uh, but it, in general, it seems that this pair-bonded relationships are extremely costly to maintain. And that the reason you then get this relationship between group size as a whole and brain size in primates is that what primates have done have generalized this kind of cognitive machinery, as it were, used to make pair bonds in other species into other members of the group. In other words, they've created friendships. And that that kind of deeply bonded relationships that underpin primate groups is a speciality of this whole family to which we belong, their kind of core evolutionary response to solving the problems of life and death, as it were, and survival and successful reproduction, is a communal one. They've, they've tried to solve these things collaboratively. And that means that primate social systems are, and indeed ours, since we're just sort of jobbing primates in one sense, are really implicit social contracts. They're all about community and maintaining community integration and cohesion. And if you, if you can't do that, because your brain is too small. You just don't get the kinds of benefits that they've had. And that may be one reason why primates have been so successful. As a group, they have changed least 
They were around when the dinosaurs <laughs> were still around, and they've changed least of any of the groups of, of uh, mammals over that long, long period of time. They've been extremely successful. Religion's very interesting, I think, because actually I've come to the conclusion, I mean, it's, it's for evolutionary folk, people who do evolutionary biology and so on, it's been very much out of the cold since when forever, because they, you know, there's enough flack, you get enough flack doing science, you know, religion is worse, leave it to somebody else to worry about. But it's, it's started to suddenly become very interesting, because here's something which people make huge commitments to, literally life and death commitments to them. Um, and the question is why? I mean, evolutionarily speaking, that's not bizarre exactly, but if, if when you get such heavy costs being incurred, there must be some benefit. And I think the answer is that the benefit is, comes in terms of social cohesion. That's what it evolved for. But the important thing is it evolved in very, very small-scale communities, these 150s that typify hunter-gatherer community sizes. What it was designed to do is a mechanism to make everybody tow the same hymn sheet, literally. But it wasn't religion as, it's not religion as we know. So if you look at traditional religions of that kind, what we used to call animism, uh, now goes under, more under the name shamanism and, and the like, because what they are is they're experiential things. There's no theology. It's something you, that's deeply experienced, often through trance states and the like. And one of the consequences of dancing, <laughs> singing, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, aside from inducing trance states of this kind, is it pours out endorphins. Right? And in, I think endorphins are the key to social bonding. What seems to happen is primates have in particular, because of these deeply bonded relationships, needed some very, very powerful mechanism to make relationships stick together. And they've captured the endorphin system, which is part of your pain control system. It's the third arm of your pain control system. It's what makes you, laughter is a very good trigger of endorphins. So when you go to see Frank Skinner or somebody at, 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 and laugh and laugh and laugh, when you come out, you feel that kind of lightheadedness. And you'll talk to anybody. So sometimes I gather the, the, the arts people, dr dramatic drama people will say, you know, people go into a play as individuals and they come out as an audience. In other words, you go in, you know, sort of a bit like this, and when you come out into the foyer afterwards, you're telling other, the person next to you you've never met before your life story. Right? That's the consequence of this endorphin surge. And it's very easy to trigger. So religious rituals of that kind, I think, are very, very... That's why they're so co common to all religions. But what's happened is, the, you know, you've, some religions, if you like, have built a, 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 a metaphysics on top of that, largely to explain why you should keep turning up and doing it, to get your little uh, endorphin surge every, every week, whichever you choose. Uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is actually, if you look at the frequency with which these things occur, if you live in very small communities, the, of these traditional kinds. They tend to do, uh, the Kung San, for example, in the movie, they tend to do trance dancing about once a month. Whereas if you live in very big communities, and the world religions or the doctrinal religions that, that we kind of know and love, as it were, the Judaic, the, the Abrahamic religions and Buddhism and Hinduism and all these big religions, uh, are associated with very big community sizes. And so the rate at which you have to kind of re-inject your inoculate in medical terms has shortened. It's now weekly, or certainly in the Abrahamic religions, it's, it's much more frequent. So I think religion has played a very big role. Its problem is that it got captured by politics, if you like, it, once we had settlement. So from the Neolithic onwards, where you start to get the rise of dog, uh, uh, doctrinal religions.